we can do better than that. Good evening. Well, let's start off with a good song to get us in the spirit. Everyone stand. We're going to sing when we all get to heaven. you've missed and uh, I told you yesterday we had a goal and last night and somebody told me the day wasn't over well I think I'm gonna keep trying to stretch Sunday out we started at 24088 and we ended up last night at midnight at twenty six thousand one hundred eighteen dollars <laughs> so folks that's exciting if we're working as a church, we'll grow as a church. So we got to keep working. Uh, Preacher Bruce, I know you got some updates. We need to give everybody some updates on folks for prayer. And... Thank you, Dean. It's good to have all of you here this evening. We appreciate you. Please uh, come back tomorrow and invite others to come with you. Tomorrow evening, we're going to have Amanda and Adam Hudgens. And uh, Adam has been in an accident. Wanda, what have you got on him? Anything? So we need to pray for Adam. Amen. What a tremendous testimony. What a wonderful talent and blessing they are. Uh, but since we can't have them at Adam and Amanda, we've got the Bear Creek Choir. And they're pumped and, and filled. And we're looking forward to the Bear Creek Choir tomorrow evening. So make sure you come back for that. Uh, Brother Leonard's brother Larry passed away. And they're going tomorrow to make the arrangements. And so that will be down in Marion what a blessing. You don't know what it speaks to me, how much it speaks to me that you folks are here tonight with his brother having passed earlier today. So make sure you pray for Brother Leonard and all that family. The funeral of Carolyn Wyatt is tomorrow at Webb, uh, visitation one to two, funeral at two, burials here. So be in much prayer for that family. That's um, Arthur and Addie and, and so forth, so family member. Brad Lewis, Wanda's nephew, was in a pretty bad motorcycle accident down in Orlando, so be in prayer. Uh, Larry Michael did well today, and uh, Susan said to say that there were no surprises, which was good. Surgery went well, and uh, she said, please thank Bear Creek for their prayers. Jamie Burleson, that's Johnny Edward, and here's another blessing to me. Johnny's here, his sister passed, and uh, here's Johnny, and that funeral is late Wednesday. And so be in much prayer for that family. Um, Joanne Fry, the funeral is 1 o'clock in the cemetery, graveside service. We've had a lot of deaths recently, haven't we? And so be in much prayer for all these families. Wendy and I saw Ruth today, and uh, Lisa asked us to 
share this announcement with you. And I want to read that. Uh, I asked her, how's Ruth? Wendy and I saw Ruth today about 11 o'clock this morning. And I'll tell you about that in just a moment. But uh, late today, Lisa said, when I asked her, she said, she's still the same. Please just start letting people know that we ask for food to be taken to the shut-ins and people who need meals and not brought to us. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that not like Myrtle Ruth? Oh, my goodness. Just like Myrtle Ruth. So, and we ask instead of flowers that they donate to the building fund because Myrtle Ruth would love to do that or benevolent fund at Bear Creek Church. That was so important to her. And uh, thank you for all you've done and for your continued prayers and support. So Wendy got there today with me, and, and we're in Ruth's room, and she's awake, and, and she's uh, trying to talk to us a little bit. She's very weak, soft-spoken, and so we get there and hug her, and I say to her, which I would say to all of you, Ruth, you're such a good friend. Ruth, I love you. Wendy loves you. And she said, I love you too. I said, Ruth, what can we do for you? This is what Ruth did. She said, you can get ready to go because I'm getting ready to fly away. That's what Ruth said. So I replied back, Ruth, playing with her because we always play. Ruth, are you going to cook in heaven? She said, I hope so. I said, if you cook in heaven, are you going to make me cakes? She said, well, I plan to. I said, Ruth, I'm going. <laughs> of course, I'm going anyway. Thank God by his grace. Amen. Uh, we've had to move the dedication service from uh, Decoration Day to the second Sunday of August because of some other conflicts but that gives us more time to get the building ready. And so we're going to have a grand and glorious day in August. Thank you for giving. You've given a lot recently. Thank you for that tremendous offering to the uh, building fund and uh, for giving to the Baptist Children's Homes and all you've done. Thank you for being Bear Creek Church. I love you, brother. Are there any other announcements that we may have missed? Okay, and I know today it came out. We had a lot on the prayer list from yesterday, and I won't go over them again. <clears throat> but I know we added Jonathan Penley today that came out over the, uh, uh, the text, and so let's remember him. Are there others we need to add besides the one that Preacher Bruce has already brought up? None? Okay. Kenneth, would you do a prayer? And... Uh, after that, Pam. one that I'm going to sing is Do You Know How It Feels? You've heard me sing it many times, but think about it again tonight. And if you don't know, tonight would sure be a good night to know how it feels. Do you know how it feels to know something is missing? Hear a still small voice that you just keep dismissing. Do you know how it feels to be troubled inside? To think just for you on a cross someone died. Do you know how it feels when he knocks to surrender? Have your sins washed away, never to be remembered? And know that it's real. Tell me, do you know how it feels? Then how does it feel to know? Above. How 
heart is melted and tears start flowing the moment you felt it do you know how it feels to know you've been changed and it seems that the whole nail it to the cross whatever's in your life whatever's bothering you whatever's bogging you down nail it to the cross get rid of it because it's already been done the blood's been shed the sacrifice has been made There's something in your heart between you and the Lord. Are you drifting apart, not as close anymore? Well, there's nothing you can do that He will not forgive. So bring it to the cross, let it die so you can to the cross get it under the blood and drown your pain and every stain in the mercy flood nail it to the cross find hope and forgiveness kneel at the tree and walk away free nail it to the cross got you battered and bound are you struggling for strength and do you long to lay it down don't take another step you can kneel right where you are lay it at the cross and take a hammer in your
Yep. Yep. Before Michael comes, I want to have us uh, stand and, and we'll just ask the Lord to open our hearts and speak to us in this time of revival. But Pam, I'm so glad I know how it feels. I know how it feels. If I lay down my head on the pillow tonight and Jesus takes me home, I'm so glad I know that I know that I get to go home to be with Jesus. Amen. And I'm so glad that one day Jesus took all my sins and nailed it to the cross. And I bear them no more. Stand with me if you would. And let's ask the Lord to open our hearts and get us ready for the word. And let's also ask the Lord to clothe Brother Michael with his power and uh, give him that fresh word that we need. Open your heart now to, to the Lord and his word. Father, thank you that, God, you have nailed our sins to the cross. And that, Father, we can come and nail those things that are troubling us to that same cross. Father, what a song. God, that we know how it feels to know that everything's all right. Father, thank you for that. God, we need revival. Father, we need you, Lord. Our church family needs you. God, our community needs you. Father, do something tonight. Do a great work in our midst. Call people, Father, unto salvation, Father. Call people, God, unto service tonight. Lord, Brother Mark has already shared with us about uh, uh, whether our, our shields are brazen or whether they're gold. Help them to be gold. Lord, uh, have we resigned and just quit? Or, Father, do we need to re-sign tonight? Sign back up to serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. Father, you've blessed our speaker. We thank you for him. We thank you for his sweet wife. Father, bless him tonight. Use him, Lord, in a powerful way. Open our hearts. Help us to respond as you have us to. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Brother, thank you, thank you, thank you. Good evening to you. Good to see you. If you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, we are going to read in chapter 17. We're going to read a couple of verses like 38 and 39. This is when uh, David comes on the scene and uh, old Goliath, the old giant, uh, has been intimidating the uh, uh, children of Israel. Uh, great story, great story. And... Uh, uh, without a doubt, the greatest battle of the Old Testament is not between two countries or between two nations. It's between a giant and a ruddy little boy. That's the greatest battle. Matter of fact, probably one of the first stories we ever learned and you were taught and I was taught in Sunday school was about David and Goliath. Veggie Tales calls it David and the Big Pickle. Boy, it's good. I watched that. I don't mind telling you. Uh, I watched that. that. That's very good. But here, here's the story tonight, because here, here, here's the gist of what I want to say. And I really, I truly believe that uh, this revival, your revival, our meeting, whatever we want to call it, can hinge tonight, because I don't have any idea how many of us in this place have some giants in our lives that we need to get rid of. And we're going to talk about that. Let's, let, let's look at that tonight. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 38. And Saul armored David with his armor. 1 Samuel 17, 38. And Saul armored David with his armor and he put a helmet of brass upon his head also he armed him with a coat of mail, and David girded his sword upon his armor, and he assessed, uh, assessed to go, uh, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off him. Now here's old Goliath. Uh, let's talk about him for a minute. Uh, most guys I read said he was about nine foot nine inches. Ooh. Listen, every, every National Basketball Association general manager standing there with a contract saying, hey, I'd like to sign you. I'd like to sign you. I'm telling you, he, he was big. He was absolutely a giant. 
uh, and he had some brothers, and you are very much aware of that. But here is this little old ruddy boy who's coming on the scene that all of a sudden he's going to be involved uh, and he's going to know what to do. Now this giant for 40 days and 40 nights came out, he appears, he flaunts, he taunts Israel. He is coming out mocking them saying, Choose you a man, you dog, and come and let's fight near that size, and they were not going to be a participant in this, and they sure didn't want to go fight him. And so for 40 days and 40 nights, he chomps out there, morning, noon, and night, however many times, and he raises up his old voice and says, Hey, Israel, come fight me. Choose a man, and we'll nail it down. Mano y mano, one on one, and we'll get this battle going, and we'll see who will win this war. Forty days and forty nights. I mean to tell you, you heard him coming as he would step out and he would voice that. And I mean, Israel would run and hide. You know what? You hear me. That's David and that's Goliath and that's what Goliath did. But I want you to know if we, not just you, because I'm preaching to myself, if we have giants in our life, I am here to tell you, they will be there by our bedside when we get up in the morning. They'll haunt us during the day. They will do whatever they can to get us off path. They will do what they can to tempt us and try us. And I am here to tell you, they are just like old Goliath. They come every day until we decide to do something about it. Now they're there. They just don't come every once in a while. They are relentless. They are pressure. They come hammering down on us day in and day out. It yells at us. It intimidates us. It puts pressure on us. We get frustrated by them. They are very present in our life, aren't they? They're there. Just like this old giant, that old David has come to meet. He's bringing food to him. Now, if you ever watch a Veggie Tales, you know what he brings out to his brothers? Pizza. He comes out there bringing pizza to his brothers, and that's what he feeds Israel. That's what Veggie Tales says. But then here he is, and he says, Is there not somebody? Listen, our giants, they're not going to go away. Until we come face to face, deal with them, do what many of us don't want to do, and we'll get to that in a minute. Two, two verses I want to look at here real quick, because this was interesting to me in, in reading and studying this. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 8, I've turned back the page. Here's what, here is what Goliath said. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine and ye servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. All right, now let me look at geographically for a minute. He is standing somewhere down and what he says, he's looking up and he's telling them, hey, send somebody to come down to me. Come down here. We'll fight. Okay? Now remember that. Now look over in, uh, down to verse 25 of the same chapter. 1 Samuel 17, 25. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that is come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that, that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free of Israel, in Israel. First of all, he said right here, Hey, send somebody, come down to me. And now here's Israel saying, He's coming up. Do you see him come up? Let me tell you this about, your, about our, I don't want you to think I'm just preaching to you about our giants tonight. I am telling you, if we don't deal with them, they're going to come closer 
and closer and closer to us. And they'll get, I, I guarantee you, a guy nine foot nine, the closer he got, the bigger he looked, okay? The closer he got, the bigger he looked. Here he comes chomping, you know. Hey, come down and let's fight. And finally they get a better look at him because according to what we read, some of these guys are saying, he's coming up here. My brother and my sister and my friend, you hear me tonight. I, God Almighty wants to be the biggest in your life. But if we're not careful, we will let these giants that come in our life and come knocking on our door and get right in our face and they're not going anywhere. And if we're not careful, they'll get so close to us that they look so big and so intimidating and they just control so much of our life that you hear me, we may want to be like Jeremiah last night and just throw up our hands and say, I quit. This thing is too big for me. It is absolutely controlling my life and I cannot do anything about it to somehow get victory over it. God help us tonight. May there be somebody here that really decides tonight God is the biggest thing in my life bigger than any of the giants that I'm facing tonight. Now there's really the crust of the sermon. I could quit, but I ain't going to. The closer he got, the bigger he got. What did David do? You know what he did. He, he killed him and cut his head off. Went and put it in a tent. Kept it. What did Gideon do when he faced the Midianite? He cut their heads off. Now, I'm going to say this to you, and but I don't know everybody here or everybody's heart, but I'm going to tell you, I, I'm convinced sometimes God's people has a hard time getting rid of some things in their life because they might like it so well that they may want to come back to it and just dabble in it every once in a while. Oh, it got pretty quiet. Amen. I must have hit some. God says here with David and with old Gideon, he says, you better kill them. You better get rid of them. Because if you don't, they're going to continue. They're going to come back. They're going to get bigger. They're going to manipulate your life. They're going to control your life. They're going to dictate to your life. They're going to wreck and ruin your life. If somewhere, somehow, listen Bear Creek, if we don't deal with the giants in our life and get victory in that area and over those things, as that sweet lady sang about, sang about you, need, you need to nail it to the cross tonight and say for once and for all and forevermore, that is finished, <clears throat> that is done, and no more will that take place in my life. May God Almighty tonight help us because there are some giants that have hindered you. They may have hindered your family. They may have hindered your walk. They may have hindered your witness. They may have hindered your testimony. And here we are tonight. Here's the giant that the Israelites see. But you know what? Oh, David said, God is my giant, and this is a dwarf to me. He's not the biggest. God is. Do we believe that? We're in a Baptist church, but I wonder what we really do believe sometimes because we sure do like to hang on to some of those sins in our life that we dabble with in life. And you want to know what will hinder the moving and the stirring of God in a revival? You hear me, Christian. It is the unconfessed sin that's in the life of a believer. The lost man needs salvation. Man, my daddy used to tell me way back. He'd say, son, they had two-week revivals. And he said the first week, the old preacher would preach to the church. 
he went to Mount Tabor Baptist Church and he said, I've seen the preacher get up on the pulpit and just shout and holler. And boy, the first week the church would get right. Then the second week he'd preach to sinners and he said the sinners would get saved. Man, oh my. Here's David, the little ruddy boy. And he's facing a giant. We like to keep that which we know we need to kill. We want to hang on to it. And God says that has no place in your life. What a victory about to take place. Can I ask you something tonight? Can, can you... Do you remember a victory that you had in your life that you knew without a shadow of a doubt? I mean, there could be nothing else and nobody else, but God did that in your life. Do you remember that? Do you remember it? I mean, really remember it. Do you remember when God did what nobody else could do? Do you remember and you do the services you had? And when we came and you remember that when we left, we would say as they did when Jesus held a service that you know what? We have seen some strange things today. God help us that something happened that you know ain't in the bulletin that some way, somehow God Almighty does something that would absolutely amaze us again. We sing, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus. God help us tonight that the miracle working God, the big God, the biggest God would pass by where we are and He would touch a heart and a home and a life and a family and some way, somehow there would be victory tonight because of God Almighty doing it in your life. David goes and he sees Saul. Now you remember Saul or David is a ruddy teenage boy, maybe 15. Saul is head and shoulders above everybody else. And Saul tries to get David to wear his armor. Saul, if if I went to a clothing store, Saul would be about a 52 long. Try this on, sir. You know, while David's like a 38 short. Somebody's looked at me sometimes and said, uh, looks like a Jewish family's moved out of the rear of your britches. <laughs> I'd say, no, my daddy just beat it off of us, okay? He just beat it off of us. Oh. Saul tries to get David to wear his armor. Now let me say this in, in loving kindness, and, and I, I mean this, but I certainly see it here. Saul wants David to do it Saul's way. Saul has got good, I'm sure he's got a very meaningful purpose here, and I'm sure he's trying. But you know, David cannot fight in in Saul's armor. Saul is trying to get David to fit his mold. Here, do things this way. Do things just like I do them. Jump through my hoops. Act, look, smell just like me. And if we're not careful, we're going to try to put somebody else in our armor to let them fight the battle that they need to fight. 
But I'm going to tell you something. God has a plan for David. He didn't need that armor. He was going to go down there and get him a smooth little rock that'd probably be good for skipping in the creek. He'd go down and get him a rock. He's got him a sling. And that was going to be what David would use tonight. May God help us that you know what? God has a plan for people and God has a purpose. And if we're not careful, and if you're not careful, we'll let other people try to dictate to us how it is we ought to act and what we ought to do and here's what you need to be doing when if we would just hear and heed God and follow what it is God wants us to do David was going to be victorious but you hear me he could not wear Saul's armor that was not going to be the way God was going to do this God wants us to be what God wants us to be and what God wants us to do, God has a plan. David, you can't wear Saul's armor. Let me say this to you again, my brother and my sister. God may have to strip pride and arrogance and and temperament and our plans and get us down, you hear me, until all that we have is Him. He may have to get rid of some things in our life and strip some things off of us so that God can be what really gets the glory for what He does in our life. That's where I'm headed in this, in this little point. God may strip away our arrogance, our hypocrisy, our eloquence, our strength until we come to the place where maybe we just stand there broken and bankrupt. And then God says, trust me. Trust me. I've I've got you right where I need you. Absolutely right where I want you. David, Saul's armor's not going to fit you. You're not going to need an armor. You're not going to need an army. I am all that you need. And if you will follow me, I will kill you. will kill that old giant. You'll cut his head off. And forevermore. God is saying to me and you, stand before me. You may be empty of yourself. You may be absolutely bankrupt in this life. You may have nothing else to look to. But God is saying, trust me. Don't trust that armor. Trust me tonight. I'm what you need. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I promise to provide all of your needs according to your, my riches and glory. I love the verse. I was young and now I'm old and I have never seen the righteous forsaken or God's seed begging bread. Never! That old, when I look at what God has done and you see all the marvelous works that God has performed in our life. David is stripped of the armor He can't wear it, carry a shield. He can't wear the armor. He's got God because once again, God is the biggest in David's life. Now I'm going to ask you, and I'll probably ask you again, with every ounce of humility that I can, and yet as honestly as I can, is God the biggest one in your life tonight? Is God the biggest? These old giants are coming. And they're going to get closer and closer. Let me give you a couple of thoughts. Facing giants, what you're facing and I'm facing can be very intimidating. David bravely faced an extremely intimidating giant 
David said and David lived, My God is greater than any giant I'm going to face. I do not know what you're going through. I don't know the valleys you're in. I don't know the trials you have. I don't know the troubles you have, young person. What you're facing at school. What you're facing in a class. I don't know what's going on in your home. But I am going to tell you, God knows all about it. And while that is a big giant, you may be facing something at work. You may be facing facing something physically you may be facing something spiritually there may be some questions you need answered you may be facing some, something financially but God Almighty is he the biggest in your life tonight is he truly the biggest David is facing a nine foot nine inch fella And yet David is saying, my God's the biggest. Is God really bigger, greater than the giants in your life? Because I'm going to look at you and tell you something. Something is the biggest in your life. Something is number one. And you hear me, God will never be number two. Nobody was going to come help David. Matter of fact, he, if you read this chapter, we didn't say anything about it, but I will say it now. Uh, David not only is going to go out there and face a giant, he's going to have a conversation with one of his own brothers. And as one of his own brothers is going to mimic him and mock him and ridicule him. You keep just a few sheep. What can you do? We may be very surprised from time to time where the criticism comes from in our life. A family member, a, fam a, a brother says some very hurtful things to him. Matter of fact, we got a minute. I'm getting paid by the hour. 1 Samuel 17, 28, look here. And Eliab, his, listen, his eldest brother heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down here? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Boy, that'll bless you. Boy, that's a good old brother. He questioned his motives. He said something to humiliate him. And then that last statement is just downright ugly. Ugly. Listen, somebody has said fish and family, they smell after about three days. What? what? This brother could not even encourage him. But... Uh, that's another sermon for another day. But here's David, got a giant you got a face out there. And now all of a sudden, here's this brother, yang, 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 like a little chihuahua in his ear, you know, barking at him, you know, and he's already got enough. But you know what? God's bigger than that. And so here we go. Facing a giant can be intimidating, and the battle is very lonely because you know why? No offense, you've got giants, and I've got giants. They're my giants, and they're your giants. What you have, you, nobody else is going to be able to fight it for you. There's no counselor, no friend. It's a lonely battle, but there we grow. Because you know what? It is in the battle. It is in the valleys of our life. It is in the most trying times of our life when that giant gets so close in our life that we can absolutely learn trust God. There's nothing else. There is nobody else. Not anything. Another little quick point trusting God can, is a stabilizing experience God may as we've already said 
He may strip us down to where all that's left is faith. He's got our pride out of the way. He's got our arrogance gone. He's got the fact that we've got it all figured out. He has just absolutely brought us down to where God, I'm bankrupt, I'm broke, I have nothing. And God says, bingo, that's exactly where I want you. Then I can do something with you that nobody else will do. And you hear me? Nobody else can get the credit for what I do in your life. Other than me. And so here we go. It is a stabilizing experience. Know His promises. Read His promises. Do His will. That's the best thing. Techniques, gifts, abilities, powers, principalities are of no avail and they're no good. It's going to come to the place. You hear me economically, maybe physically, maybe socially in our world. That all we have is is God. And that's it. Trust Him. It is an intimidating battle. But you've got them. They'll come stomping down your hall. They'll get over your bed. They'll scream at you. You went to bed thinking about it. You laid your head on your pillow and it was the last thought you have when you wake up in the morning and you roll out of bed and your feet hit the floor. That old giant is still there. He's with you until we finally come to the place where we finally lay it down and say once and for all, I'm going to put it at the foot of the cross and God, I'm asking you to do what nobody else can do. I've carried it. I've been broken by it. It has burdened me. It has absolutely crippled me. I realize it is hanging on. And i got to do something. Look back with me. Go back to verse, we didn't read it, but start reading in verse 34. Let's, let, let's read in verse 33 of 1 Samuel 17. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he rose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defiled the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of a lion, out of the paw of the bear, he'll deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with you. Hear me, hear me, Bear Creek. Too many times, me and Bruce talked about this for a moment at that door back there last night. We have a tendency to remember what we ought to forget. Amen, we do. I can tell you about a lot of situations and problems and heartaches and, and no offense, deacons meetings and just folks irritated and, and, and out. And, 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 and you know, they've just got to say something to the preacher. And a lot of times, you hear me, I've had them walk up to me at 1058 and say, can I tell you something? I'm not coming back to this church knowing I had to turn around and go inside and somehow preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's one of them I would have loved to say. You didn't have to say that right now. We have a tendency to remember what we ought to forget. And then we have a tendency to forget what we ought to remember. (laughs) 
<laughs> I love it. David reminisces here for a minute. The winning victories. Boy, he said, I, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you about it. Listen, I, let, let me, I'm going to run a real quick rabbit, tell you a little bit of, of, some, of the, some of what I know about baseball. Uh, Dizzy Dean was a great pitcher. He, he is in the Hall of Fame. Uh, he and his brother Paul, they pitched for the Chicago Cubs and the St. Louis Cardinals. But Dizzy Dean would, would, would say some stuff, uh, and finally a reporter said, well, you're bragging. Dizzy Dean said, it ain't bragging if you do it. It ain't bragging if you do it. David ain't bragging other than on the Lord. He's just remembering the victories in his life. And I mean to tell you, me and you, we would have, we, we, we'd have a list of, of bad times and what people said and, and sad times and difficult times and troublesome times. And yes, there can be some wonderful victories there. But can I ask you, do you remember what I started with or what I got to finally? Do you remember some things that's happened in your life that the bottom line, you absolutely know only God could do that? Do you remember them? Do we ever tell them? Have you shared them with your children? Do you ever sit down and tell them how you were saved and what God's done for you? It ain't bragging. It's happened to you. And they need to hear that. Oh, they'll hear the gossip over the back fence. Oh, trust me, somebody will have a prayer request one day and all it'll be is trying to share some gossip about somebody. Hey, he is saying, remember, tell your family, tell your friends, pass it on, pass it down. There was a lion, there's a bear, and you know what? Before the day's over, I'm going to have a Goliath story. And I'm going to cut his head off. Remember your victory. Man, we ought to have testimonial services and what the old preachers used to call a popcorn meeting. People just popping up all over the place. I mean, tell you, praising God, giving testimony unto God and thanking God for what He's done. But you know what? Too many times we forgot that. We're afraid somebody will think we're bragging. And if we are, we're bragging on the Lord. God help us. You want God to inhabit this place. It'll be the praise of His people about what He has done in our life. David simply reminding himself and telling Saul and saying to God, do it again. In. You've helped me with a lion. You've helped me with a bear. And now I've got this guy who thinks he's a giant, but up next to you he is a dwarf. Whew. You hear me. Whew. Whatever victories, let me say this to you. Whatever victories you share, you make sure God gets the glory for what He does. I do not know. <clears throat> I don't know what you're facing. You don't know what I'm facing. You may have a giant and a job. There could be a giant and a roommate. There could be a giant at school. There could be a personal disaster. There could be a divorce. There could be family problems. There could be sickness. But you hear me, something is lurking in your life. I'm not asking you to witch hunt. I don't have to witch hunt on this. But you know it. Something is sucking the life out of you and the vitality out of you. And God is saying tonight, let me be the giant in your life. I can take care of that. 
if you'll bring it to me and lay it at his feet. Come, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come. Listen, I, I, I believe come is one of God's favorite words he ever says. If you'd like an acrostic for come, I'll give it to you. C is for children. Children, you can come. May your heart be as a little child, but you come. O is for the old people. Thank God there's still room at the cross for us old folks. He says, come, children, come old, middle age. And E is for everybody. He says, come tonight. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what giants you have in your life. I don't know what decisions you've got to make. I don't know what phone calls you got today. I don't know what came in your mailbox. I haven't looked at your phones and I ain't been by to check your mailboxes. I have no idea what's going on. But you realize there's some giants in your life. And you know what? Here's a story of a little ruddy 15-year-old boy who said, God's the giant in my life. And you know what? I'm going to whoop this old giant and I'm going to kill him, and I'm going to cut his head off, and buddy, we, God will reign supreme when we do that. Will you pray with me tonight? Father, in the name of Jesus, we bring this story to you. I pray already right now, may I, may I be a so bold, if there's folks that you're dealing with, maybe you've put your finger on some giants in their life, Maybe there's some things they're wrestling with. Something that is absolutely controlling them, intimidating them, dictating to them, ruling them. And if we don't get it and get it nipped in the bud and put God Almighty back on the throne, it will absolutely ruin and wreck their life tonight. I pray for somebody, a mother, a father, a teenager, a boy, a girl, someone tonight that they realize come face to face with a giant in their life. And tonight they're going to finally say, I want God to be the biggest in my life. I have listened to these lies. I have listened to this giant in my life. And for once and for all, I want God to be the Lord and to rule in my heart again. Oh God, I pray for this church because this tonight can make this revival what it needs to be when some folks finally break their pride and arrogance or whatever it is that's going to keep them seated tonight. And they're going to get up and they're going to make their way to the old rugged cross. They may grab their pastor and say, pray with me. I need help in this. This thing is controlling me and I need victory in Jesus tonight. I pray God that you will. Somebody that's lost tonight, undone, separated from God and His Son, may they look to the old rugged cross and realize Jesus suffered and bled and died for the forgiveness of man's sins. And they can be set free. Set free. Now, Father, you take this invitation. I'm through. And I pray that you'll touch in the mighty name of Jesus. And may God Almighty be honored and glorified. us tonight. Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. What a message. Amen. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 29 closes with this question. It's a question to all of us. Is there not a cause? There was Israel camped out, and, and they were cowered down, defeated by Goliath, and, uh, and somebody needed to do something. And if you look at where we are today, our homes are in trouble, Brother Michael. They are. Our churches are weak and frail, and maybe we individually today are just cowering down because of just not trusting the Lord and seeking the Lord. Can, can I just be honest with this, Brother Michael? 
There should never be a time when this altar is not full of people out here praying. And if you're not having trouble, then somebody else is having trouble. And there's a lot of lost folks that need to have somebody down here praying for them. And they need to be led by the deacons and they need to be led by the teachers and they need to be led by the seniors in the church. They need to come. There should never be a time, Brother Michael. Amen. Should never be a time where we don't use this altar and pray. Is there not a cause tonight, Bear Creek? Listen, when those that should be asleep have woke up, they're woke now. I mean, we got woke folk in, in America today. And they're proclaiming all kinds of weird stuff and ungodly stuff. And those that should be woke up are asleep today. And so we need to wake up, amen. The time is that we should wake up and that we should pray up and beg God. So I'm asking you tonight. While, while Miss Pam plays, that we would come and visit this altar and just ask God to do a great work. Ask the Lord for the churches. Ask the Lord for the homes. Ask the Lord for our young people. Ask the Lord, my friends, tonight. Would you come?
uh, Emma and Kennedy have as well. Danielle has never joined a church before. She knows Jesus, she's been baptized, but we get the privilege of being the very first church that Danielle has ever joined. And uh, she is so sweet, bearing a lot of the fruits of the Spirit. And so Danielle, what is the pleasure of the church that we receive Danielle as uh, under her statement that she's been saved, baptized, and uh, allowing her to become a member of Bear Creek? All those in favor? Amen. We all love you. Amen. Would you stand here and let us hug you just a little bit? And Emma and Kennedy, is that okay too? Okay. All right. So, so let's close with a prayer. Amen. Let's, let's do it. Eddie, would you close? Sorry. And you folks come by and let Daniel Dear kind, gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for the wonderful words we've heard tonight. God, thank you for to us. Father, I pray, Lord God, that we can line up our giants, Lord God, and just knock them down one by one with you at our side, Lord God, because just like David said, there is none bigger than our God. Father, help us to lean on you and to trust you, dear Lord God. I pray for this church. I pray for this revival, dear Lord God. I pray for all the things that you have lined up for us in our God. Go with us through the remainder of this week, dear Lord God. Help us to bring others to know you. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen.